Thank you for listening to this teaching from Casa View Baptist Church, located in Garland, Texas. Our mission is to love God, build relationships, and change the world. To learn more, visit casaviewbaptist.org. Thank you so, so much. The question of today is, why do we need to suit up? Now remember, I've already told you as we've been working through this passage, we've spent several weeks already, that as a follower of Christ, you already know that you've won, okay? When you and I follow Jesus Christ, you win. In other words, the end of the race is done, the game is over, everybody out of the pool, everybody's past go, you win. The question for the believer is not whether or not you win. The question is, as a believer, what do you do between now and when the time is over? Amen? The question is not, is Jesus coming back? Yes, he is. The Bible says he's going to return. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with him, and we will be with the Lord in glory forever. You win. You're on the winning team. Now, the question is, what does it look like between now and and then, several weeks back, I was talking to a friend of mine, and he said, man, I am so excited that TCU is going to get to demonstrate to the world that the Big 12 is a great conference still, even without A&M. And I looked at him and I said, who are you trying to impress? He said, it's going to be a great game. I realize that, you know, we, 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 we got in there kind of at the end, just, but, but we're, we've proven ourselves last week, and it's going to be great. And I asked him a question. I said, when was the last time that somebody from your conference beat somebody in the SEC in the BCS Championship Series? Just name a game. He said, well, I need to go look it up. I said, well, go look it up. And when you find a time that that's happened, come back and let me know. And when that happens, I'll celebrate with you. But until it happens, just, okay. <clears throat> so anyway, we, uh, we, we, we met together for breakfast on Tuesday. He said, preacher, I sure am glad you're not a betting man. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you picked Georgia in 20 points. Do you realize that you could retire? And I said, well, he said, you know, it's never happened. And you're going, Carl, why are you bringing that up? The psalmist said, I have never seen the godly forsaken or the righteous begging bread. As a follower of Christ, you're never going to lose. Now, I spend all that time telling you that because the next verse of Scripture I'm going to give you, if you don't have that mindset, you're going to go, mm, not a good day to be in church. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13 says this, Dear friends, do not be surprised when the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening. There are no move screens on me yet. He said, when the trial comes, he doesn't say, if it comes. He doesn't say that it might come. He says, and when it comes. He doesn't say that it's just a little thing. He said, it's a fiery thing. I was on a youth trip one time when I was, when I was a kid, and we were going to, the, to Opryland, and we were staying at the Opryland Hotel and that's when they had matchbooks at bars and a buddy of mine went into the bar that morning because the bar was closed. Baptist kids can go into a bar when bars are closed. And we got us a whole bunch of matches and we took them up to our floor, which was on the 10th floor. And we went out on the balcony because it was cool. And we'd light a book of matches, the whole book. We'd light one, strike the whole book and we'd throw it out. And it looked like a fiery helicopter going down to the ground. He showed me how to do that, and I said, man, that's cool. He said, no, Dino, just strike the match, 
put your finger, just hold, you've you got to hold the, the matches away from the paper. I'm not telling you this so you'll go try it. I'm telling you, don't do this, okay? Kids watching some face, don't do this, okay? So I put my finger between the matches and the paper matchbook and I lit that match and I went like that and it didn't fly off and all those matches caught and it caught my finger on fire. Oh, as Jerry Clower would say. I screamed and I flicked it. I didn't do any more. I went and rubbed cold water on it. I even, I even had heard that mustard fix it. I went down to the bar, stole a couple of packs of mustard, and I had mustard all over my finger. But I was not going to tell anybody that I did that because I knew that they would look at me like, how stupid can you be? <laughs> Apparently, pretty much. I couldn't even stand in line at the rides. I had spent all of the money I had buying cups of ice, and I was walking around... Opryland with my finger in a cup of ice because it just hurt so bad. Finally, I, I went to a security guard and I said, listen, I, I hate to ask, but I, I, I need some help bad. I burnt my finger and I looked up, you know, my fingernails kind of just black and hanging over this way. And he said, we need to go to the, I forgot what they called it. But anyway, nurse looked at it and said, how did you burn your finger here? What did you do? I said, well, this morning I kind of caught it on fire. How do you catch your finger on fire? And I said, ma'am, you don't want to know. She said, teenage boys, boy, you kids are stupid. <laughs> she put some stuff on it, and it immediately calmed it down. Anyway, I've had the tip of my finger caught on fire, and it hurt. The word there for fire is... This, is, is likened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they were in the furnace. If you hadn't been in the furnace of life, I just want to let you know that it's not if you get in there, it's when. And I'll be quite frank with you, our culture in America is entering into a time of being in the furnace. Especially if you're a believer that actually believes in the teachings of Scripture. Now, you can be one of these manby pamby milk toast guys that says, well, it really doesn't really mean that. Peter goes on to say, he said, but rejoice. When you're in the fire and it is starting to hurt, you need to rejoice. And I talked about that last week a couple of times. Gap 10. Rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. At the end, when it is all over and God's glory is revealed and you're part of that glory and he stands up and says, Son, daughter, you're with me. Woo! It's going to be good. Now the question is, what does that fiery trial look like? So going back to Ephesians, that's all the introduction, okay. It's about out of time already. Ephesians chapter 10, verse 10 and 11. Finally be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wilds of Satan. Later on in verse 13, he said, Therefore, put on the whole, the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then. You and I need to put on the armor of God. And we're going to start talking about what that armor like looks like next week. But this week, I want to talk to you why you and I need to be fully and completely suited up. We've talked about how Satan is going to attack. The question is, in how is he going to attack? Sometimes he attacks physically, as he did Job. There's a point in time in Job's life, matter of fact, Job was one of the most godly men of his day. God mentions it. Satan even mentions it as he goes before God and accuses God and says, the only reason why Job is so godly is because you give him all this stuff. And God said, okay, you can take all the stuff away. 
At one point in time, Job is sitting down with boils and pus oozing from his skin in ashes and in sackcloth. His wife looks at him in my version and said, Job, why don't you just curse God and go on and die? Boy, isn't that a wonderful husband wife? When your wife looks at you and said, baby, I think it'd be easier if you just go on and die. You're going to be attacked mentally like David was. David, did you know that your son is trying to get the army to follow him and supplant you as king? But the truth is, mostly, for the most part, you and I are going to be attacked spiritually and theologically. When the serpent came to Eve, it wasn't a physical attack. It was playing mind games and spiritual questioning. Come on, Eve, did God really say? Eve, did God really mean that? So that the direct commandments of God became obsolete for another time. You mean the first argument that Satan makes so that the first sin that's committed is an argument about, did God really mean that? Yeah. I think Satan was going to Eve and saying, Eve, that's so old school. That's the way it used to be. But now Eve is a new time. If Eve would have had a grandmother, Satan would have said, no, your granny believed that. You don't have to believe that now. That's your mom and dad's religion, not now. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, very pointedly, Paul says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, against rulers, against the authorities and great powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil. You see, the truth is that you and I need to, to learn to stand in God's grace. In Romans chapter 5, verse 2, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace by which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. How is it that our grace, that God's grace is attacked in our lives? How about the argument when somebody comes, well, as a Christian, you're not perfect. No, I'm not. But God's grace is sufficient. Just because God's grace is sufficient doesn't mean that you and I have permission to do whatever we want to do, though. I was talking to a guy who cheated on his wife. I said, why'd you do it? He said, well, I knew she loved me and she'd forgive me. Boy, that's a good reason, isn't it? The same way with God. You see, I believe that people are going to come to Christians in this day and age when you and I stand on God's word and say, well, you're not perfect. No, I'm not. I'm so thankful that God's grace is sufficient so that when I've blown it, God has been there to forgive me and continue to love me. Another way that God's grace is challenged is that people say, well, you know, if God's grace is sufficient, then I can do whatever I want. God's grace is not permission to do the wrong thing. Grace is forgiveness when you and I have failed to perform the way God desires. We stand in God's grace. We we stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which I received, on which you have taken your stand. The Bible says there is no other way to get to God other than Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. There are many in our day that are going to say, profess, well, you know, there's, there's a number of ways to be happy. There's a number of ways to be fulfilled. Okay. But the truth is, if you're dealing with eternity, there's only one way to meet God in eternity on God's terms, and that is through Jesus Christ. For that, I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to stand down. I'm not going to acquiesce because it makes somebody feel better. Guys, the truth is the truth. People are looking at Christians and saying, well, you're legalistic. Okay, 
I'm legalistic. Well, well, you're, that's, that's obnoxious to think that there's only one way. I won't tell you what, I praise God for obnoxious elementary school teachers. We've got some in our room. They're as pig-headed and obnoxious as I, people as I've ever known. Now, before you get all mad at me, I've always been a little more forceful in my opinion, especially when I was a child. My mother would say that I'd argue with a fence post. I can't tell you how many times I'd argue with the teachers. I, I, I had a teacher at Brock Elementary in the second grade, and I tried to explain to her that in some cases, two plus two equaled five. Miss Haddon was the most pig-headed, legalistic, authoritarian teacher. She marked it wrong. How dare her? I even checked it. You know, it's two plus two, and then you put five, and then you subtract two from five, and that gives you two. I even checked it. I checked my work, and it was right, and she graded it wrong. She explained to me that there, there's no such word as fenda and spunt. Come on, guys. There is a word called spunt. I can use it in a sentence. I spunt all of my money. I'm thin to go to the stove. I came from the Delta of Arkansas, and that was proper grammar in the Delta of Arkansas in 1968. I'm thin to go to the stove. Well, what in the world is the stove? How do you spell stove? It's S-T-O-W. The stove. Well, what do you do at the stove? Well, you buy stuff. No, that's the store. No, that's a stove. Another argument, another red mark. She was hard-headed the entire year. I thought it was because she was mean. The problem is that two plus two has always equaled, help me out, four. And the store has always been spelled S-T-O-R-E, no matter if you pronounce it S-T-O-W. And I hope and pray that there never is a dictionary word called fenda or spunt. <laughs> Even though I could use them in sentences and I spelled them phonetically correct. You need to understand, I called myself Dino, that is D-E-N-O, regardless of how the Flintstones spelled their dog, D-I-N-O, which is wrong, it's D-E-N-O. Guys, you're going to have to stand on the gospel. There are a bunch of people that are out there saying there are multiple ways to get to God. There's just one. We need to stand in courage and in strength. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous and be strong. At some point in the time, the church has got to grow up and stand strong for the gospel of Jesus Christ and speak it courageously not backing down. We're going to have to stand in faith, 2 Corinthians 2.24, not that we lord it over you, your faith, but we work for you for your joy because it is by faith that you do what? That you stand firm. Guys, your faith is going to be sorely tested. You're going to go, am I sure? And that's when you're going to have to get out God's word and look it up and say, yep, yeah, I'm sure. Your faith is going to be tested that following God is the right way to go. We stand in faith. We stand in courage and strength. We stand in the gospel. We stand in grace. We stand in Christian liberty. If you go to the founding fathers of our country and you go back to where they learned about freedom and liberty, they learned in church. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, For it is freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. The idea is that you and I follow an audience of one. 
I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And I stand firm in the fact that he has called me, he has named me, he says what I can do, he says where I will go. I follow him and abide by his teachings, trusting that in the end, that God wins. Guys, I can't tell you how liberating that is. I have people that say, well, in following Jesus a bunch of rules... You know, there are a lot of things about following God that God says, you know, as a Christian, you're not supposed to do. But you know what all those things are for? They're not things to hurt you. They're things to help you. Can you imagine my dad is a pastor of the church, my mom is a pastor's wife, if they would have come into our hotel room while we're lighting books and matches, just throwing them off the balcony, what my mom would have said, she would have went, Dino, stop that. And if I didn't, she would say, I'm going to get your dad, and he's going to get out the belt. Don't do that. I mean, you all know I got my nickname. It's Dean No. Dean No. I got lost in the department store. They asked me what my my name was, and I said, it's Dean No. That's what my family's called me now for, well, it'll be 60 years this week. Dean No. Why? Because the truth about it is, is that what they wanted was not to keep me from having fun, but keep me from burning my stupid finger off. God's rules are not about taking things away from you. They're freeing you to live a full and complete life. We stand firm in liberty. We stand firm in Christian unity. Guys, I want you to hear me, and I'm going to share with you my heart. I don't think America would be where it is today if Southern Baptists would have come together as a group of people in the 70s and 80s. If you go to the growth and the churches, Southern Baptists reaching people for Jesus Christ, is like that. The trajectory of missionaries is like this, of church planning is like this, until we got into an argument. And instead of being unified and following Jesus Christ and getting together and sitting in a room and working it out, it's I'm going to take my toys and you're going to take your toys. The number one tool that Satan uses to stop the movement of Jesus Christ in the church and in your home is disunity. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in what? One spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. There has never been a husband, there's never been a wife that have cheated and left their home when a husband and wife were not together and joined together in purpose and intent in home together. Guys don't like looking when home life is cooking. I made that one up. If you don't like it, get over it. Any woman can come up to a man when home is cooking and go, man, you sure look nice today. And I'm telling you, the first thing is, wooga, 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 it's cooking at home. I ain't messing with that. Uh Uh-uh, get away from me. No woman has ever left her husband when he was doing what the Apostle Paul said, dying daily for her. Matter of fact, When a husband is dying daily for his wife, the nagging and griping actually happens to stop most of the time. Why? Because I got a good thing. I'm not going to get rid of it. Unity. Unity in church. Strive to come together. That's why Paul said, husbands and wives, do not be unequally yoked with non-believers because what holds you together is standing one in Jesus Christ. 
We stand in unity. We stand in liberty. We stand in the Lord. Philippians 4, 1, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. And this is what I want to do. James, you can help me. I need to somehow figure out how to get people to watch that video that John sent me. Matter of fact, John, will you send the link to James to that video for me, please? I don't mind if you even text during service, okay? Now, when you look at that one, there's another one that I like even more than John's, and that's when the guy that wrote the song is with CC and BB Winings. Now, it's like 18 minutes. And I realize it's a choir just yanked singing at the top of their long stand. When you're facing troubles, stand. When your friends have left you, stand. With passion and hunger, the song is nothing about anything other than I am standing with the Lord. I'm going to stand with the Lord. I love what Joshua said. We love that phrase. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. My wife has bought a business in the business, and we sat down with folks that are running and said, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to serve the Lord. First things first is that the company's going to tithe right off the top. Second thing, we're not going to cheat. We're not going to, we're going to do everything right. Whatever taxes have to be paid, taxes are going to be paid. Well, I hate that I said that one. Goodness. The real inventory is the real inventory when it comes to have just across the board. Why? Because being a follower of Christ means that you do things according to the law whether it's in your business or your home. Worst thing ever happens in the world is when the world finds out that a Christian has done something underhanded. I can't tell you how many times I've cried because a pastor has acted like some idiot Elmer Gantry. When a pastor says, well, okay, I know the Bible says that that's wrong, but we live in a different kind of time. And I go, oh, Lord. You know, if you do that, you get to fly on Lear jets that you own. I tell you how we can become the richest church in town. You ready? Start convincing everybody that for $1,000, if they'll just give $1,000, we'll guarantee that they'll get into heaven. And you can do anything you want to after that. Just give us $1,000. We might not have a lot of people in the pews, but we'll have a whole lot of money. Has it been done before? <laughs> yeah. I'll never forget sitting down talking to Dennis Tubb. He went over to a televangelist here in town, and he was mad at Dennis because Dennis couldn't get his 13 phones to roll over. And he said, every single hour, I'm missing $20,000 in donations, and I'm going to sue you and your company. Western Bell or Bell Western or whatever it was, I don't know. And he said, that preacher that, that I'd seen on channels of TV was cussing me out because of how much money he was losing because... His phones wouldn't roll over so all of his people couldn't take donations. Guys, I'm going to tell you what, when you stand for the Lord, it's not about money, it's not about privilege, it's not about heritage, it's not about who's going to love you. It's the fact that I play to an audience of one and Jesus Christ is it and I'm going to follow him and Satan's going to come at you about that. Satan's going to say, well, you fit in better. I'll never forget, I said something about Donald Trump. One Sunday, we had eight people get up and walk out of the room. Said, we're never going to come back to our, your church because you said something bad about Donald Trump. And, I said, Trump. and I said, well, did I tell the truth? And they said, well, but yeah, but you still shouldn't have said it. Well, is it true? But, but it, it made him look bad in what he did. And I said, it, that's not the point. Is it true? Guys, sometimes the truth hurts. There are times that you have to look at people that you love and tell them the truth. And when you stand for God and when you stand with the Lord, sometimes you have to tell the truth and the truth hurts. We stand in unity. We stand in the Lord. We should stand perfect and complete, assured in the will of God. Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. 
It'll be my last one, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Jesus Christ, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may do what? What is he praying about for you? That you would stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. One of the greatest joys of my life is to spend every single morning in my home with a cup of coffee and my Bible and spend time praying for you guys. Every single day. Why? That you would be complete and you would fulfill God's will for your life. You see, God's will for each of your individual lives is different than everybody else in this room. God has not called anybody to be the same thing that you are. Now, principles are all the same. I mean, the way we follow God, it's, it's the same. But how you live your life and the ways in which you affect people, the people that you're connected to, the ministry that you've been called, the job that you've been given, the skill set that you have, the mental makeup that you have, the emotional integrity that you have is different than every single person in this room. And God has a specific will for you. He said, Epaphras, who came from your church, spends his days praying that you will stand firm in God's will for your life fully assured what? That if I follow God's will, that God will provide. At some point in time, you've got to decide, I am called to stand. Then you've got to decide, you know, if I'm called to stand, then I'm going to stand. But guys, if you're going to stand, you've got to commit yourself to be prepared to stand. Because when you do, the fiery darts are coming, guys. And because of this, Paul says in Ephesians 6, 13, as the band comes up, therefore, put on the full armor of God. Because when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground. I want to let you know, when you decide to stand for God and be the man or woman God's called you to be, you better be suited up. Now, for the next several weeks, we're going to talk about the specific things that you need to do in order to be prepared to stand in a lost and dying culture. What does it look like? How do I do it? How do I need to prepare myself to stand? As a little kid, I grew up watching Clark Kent and Superman. That was before Clark Kent ever had a baby with Lois Lane. I grew up in the pure days. <clears throat> One of the things that I thought was just wild, that just blew my mind, is that Clark Kent wore two sets of clothes. Every time he got in the elevator or, or a phone booth or one of them swirling doors, the first thing you'd see is he's unbuttoning his shirt and you could see this top of the Superman top, right? You see, underneath his clothes was the suit of Superman. For a long time, I wondered, where'd he get the other suit? I was too little because I thought, you know, you took off one set of clothes, you put on the other set, right? I mean, that's what you and I do. We go into our dressing room, take off a set of clothes, put on another one. But no, not Superman. Superman underneath the attire of a, of a newspaper reporter always had a big top that said S for Superman. He always had those tights underneath it. I never could figure out how he folded the cape up to fit underneath that shirt and suit coat, though. But as soon as that elevator door opened, whew, he'd put up that fist and he'd go. Believer putting on the armor of Christ the same way. You might be dressed in jeans and cowboy boots or sneakers and shorts. 
But Paul said that every day you need to be suited up with the armor of God because the darts are coming. Today I ask you, have you decided to stand? The question remains though, are you prepared? Next week I'm going to help you start learning how to do that if you already don't know. Please stand and we'll worship together.